So Leo Tolstoy is someone that Jordan Peterson has brought up many times, and it's someone that Owen Benjamin has recently mentioned on his stream, and he has mentioned it in the past year or so, a few times. And specifically, I think they both have mentioned Tolstoy in regards to um, his confession. And I have a book here. Um, it's A Confession and Other Religious Writings by Leo Tolstoy. And uh, so I thought Owen tried to read some of this book on his uh, one of his recent live streams. And he said it was a little bit too heavy for a live stream. And I agree, the, re the reading and is kind of heavy for a live stream. But uh, So I'm going to attempt to read it now, and I'm going to get into it uh, one chapter at a time, beginning with chapter 4, because I think that's where it really starts to pick up. And that's the chapter that uh, you start to see Tolstoy uh, coming to terms with his materialism, with his atheism, um, after he's achieved worldly success as a writer, and what that means. These are short chapters, I think four, five, six, all these up to chapter like four, they're all pretty short, three, three or four page chapters. And so I'm going to do them one at a time. And this one particularly, you're going to see Tolstoy talking about trying to kill himself um, or the, the dangers of suicide while he's in such a state of mind. And you're going to hear him talk about a Eastern fable that Owen uh, brought up in his recent live stream regarding a traveler who was chased by a beast and he takes shelter in a well uh, and at the bottom of the well is a dragon or some other kind of beast who's trying to eat him. And uh, so I will start with chapter four and continue chapter by chapter as I have time. My life came to a standstill. I could breathe eat, drink, and sleep, and I could not help breathing, eating, drinking, and sleeping. But there was no life in me, because I had no desires whose gratification I would have deemed it reasonable to fulfill. If I wanted something, I knew in advance that whether or not I satisfied my desire, nothing would come of it. If a magician had come and offered to grant my wishes, I would not have known what to say. If in my intoxicated moments I still had the habit of desire, rather than real desire, in my sober moments, I knew that it was a delusion and that I wanted nothing. I did not even wish to know the truth because I had guessed what it was. The truth was that life is meaningless. It was as if I had carried on living and walking until I reached a precipice from which I could see clearly that there was nothing ahead of me other than destruction. But it was impossible to stop and impossible to turn back or close my eyes in order not to see that there was nothing ahead other than deception of life and of happiness, and the reality of suffering and death, of complete annihilation. Life had grown hateful to me, and some insuperable force was leading me to seek deliverance from it by whatever means. I could not say that I wanted to kill myself. The force beckoning me away from life was a more powerful, complete, and overall desire. It was a force similar to me to my striving after life only it was going the, in the other direction. I fought as hard as I could against life. The thought of suicide now came to me as naturally as thoughts of improving my life had previously come to me. This idea was so attractive to me that I had to use cunning against myself in order to avoid carrying it out too hastily. I did not want to rush simply because I wanted to make every effort to unravel the matter. I told myself that if I could not unravel the matter now, I still had time to do so. And it was at this time that I, a fortunate man, removed a rope from my room where I, where I undressed every night alone, lest I hang myself from the beam between the cupboards. And I gave up taking a rifle with me on hunting trips so as not to be tempted to end my life in such an all-too-easy fashion. I myself did not know what I wanted. I was afraid of life and strove against it, yet I still hoped for something from it. All this was happening to me at a time when I was surrounded on all sides by what is considered complete happiness. I was not yet fifty. I had a kind, loving, and beloved wife, lovely children, and a large estate that was growing and expanding with no effort on my part. I was respected by relatives and friends far more than ever before. I was praised by strangers and could consider myself a celebrity without deceiving myself. Moreover, I was not unhealthy in mind or body. 
but on the contrary, enjoyed a strength of mind and body such as I had rarely witnessed in my contemporaries. Physically, I could keep up with the peasants tilling the fields. Mentally, I could work for eight or ten hours at a stretch without suffering any ill effects from the effort. And in these circumstances, I found myself at the point where I could no longer go on living, and, since I feared death, I had to deceive myself in order to refrain from suicide. This spiritual condition presented itself to me in the following manner. My life is some kind of stupid and evil joke that someone is playing on me. Despite the fact that I did not acknowledge any such someone who might have created me, this concept of there being someone playing a stupid and evil joke on me by bringing me into the world came to me as a most natural way of expressing my condition. I could not help feeling that out there somewhere somebody was amusing himself by looking at me and the way I had lived for thirty or forty years, studying, developing, maturing, in mind and body, and how now, with a fully matured intellect, having reached the precipice from which life reveals itself, I stood there like an utter fool, believing so firmly that there is nothing in life, and there never has been, nor ever will be. Quote, and he laughs. End quote. But whether or not this someone laughing at me really existed, did not make it any easier for me. I could, n I could not attribute any rational meaning to a single act, let alone to my whole life. I simply felt astonished that I had failed to realize this from the beginning. It had all been common knowledge for such a long time. Today or tomorrow sickness and death will come, and they had already arrived, to those dear to me and to myself, and nothing will remain other than the stench and the worms. Sooner or later my deeds, whatever they may have been, will be forgotten and will no longer exist. What is all the fuss about, then? How can a person carry on living and fail to perceive this? That is what is so astonishing. It is only possible to go on living while you are intoxicated with life. Once sober, it is impossible not to see that it is all a mere trick, and a stupid trick. That is exactly what it is. There is nothing either witty or amusing. It is only cruel and stupid. There is an old eastern fable about a traveler who is taken unawares on the steps by a ferocious wild animal. In order to escape the beast, the traveler hides in an empty well, but at the bottom of the well he sees a dragon with its jaws open, ready to devour him. The poor fellow does not dare to climb out because he is afraid of being eaten by the rapacious beast. Neither does he dare drop to the bottom of the well for fear of being eaten by the dragon. So he seizes hold of a branch of a bush that is growing in the crevices of the well and clings on to it. His arms grow weak, and he knows that he will soon have to resign himself to the death that awaits him on either side. Yet he still clings on, and while he is holding on to the branch, he looks around and sees that two mice, one black and one white, are steadily working their way around the bush he is hanging from, gnawing away at it. Sooner or later they will eat through it, and the branch will snap, and he will fall, fall into the jaws of the dragon. The traveler sees this, and knows that he will inevitably perish. But while he is still hanging there, he sees some drops of honey on the leaves of the bush, stretches out his tongue and licks them. In the same way I am clinging to the tree of life, knowing full well that the dragon of death inevitably awaits me, ready to tear me to pieces, and I cannot understand how I have fallen into this torment and I try licking the honey that once consoled me, but it no longer gives me pleasure. The white mouse and the black mouse, day and night, are gnawing at the branch from which I am hanging. I can see the dragon clearly, and the honey no longer tastes sweet. I can see only one thing, the inescapable dragon and the mice, and I cannot tear my eyes away from them. And this is no fable but the truth, the truth that is irrefutable and intelligible to everyone. The delusion of the joys of life that had formerly stifled my fear of the dragon no longer deceived me. No matter how many times I am told, you cannot understand the meaning of life, do not think about it, but live. I cannot do so, because I have already done it for too long. Now I cannot help seeing day and night chasing me, and leading me to, de to my death. This is all I can see, because it is the only truth. All the rest is a lie. Those two drops of honey which more than all else had diverted my eyes from the cruel truth, my love for my family and for my writing, which I called art, I no longer found sweet. 
quote, the family, I said to myself, but my family, my wife and children are also human beings. They are in exactly the same position as I am. They too must either live a lie or face the terrible truth. What do they live for? Why do I love them and look after them, bring them up and watch over them? In order to reach the same state of despair that fills me? In order to be dull-witted? If I love them, I cannot conceal the truth from them. Each step taken in knowledge leads them to this truth, and the truth is death. Quote, art, poetry, end quote. For a long time, under the influence of success and praise from others, I had persuaded myself that this was a thing that could be done, despite the fact of approaching death which obliterates everything, myself, my works, and the memory of both. But I quickly realized that this too was a, del a delusion. It was clear to me that art is an adornment, an embellishment of life, but it had lost its charm for me. So how could I charm others? Well, I was not living my own life, but was being carried along on the crest of another life, as long as I believed that life had meaning, even if I could not express it, the reflection of life in poetry and in art of all kinds gave me joy, and I enjoyed watching life through the mirror of art. But when I began to search for the meaning of life, when I began to feel in the necessity of living, I found the mirror either unnecessary, superfluous and ridiculous, or tormenting. I could no longer be comforted by what I saw in the mirror, namely my stupid and desperate position. It was all right for me to rejoice in the sight, while in the depths of my soul I believed that my life had meaning. Then the play of light and shade, the comic, the tragic, the touching, the beautiful, and the frightening aspects of life comforted me. But when I saw that life is meaningless and terrible, the play in the mirror could no longer amuse me. However sweet the honey, it could not be sweet to me, while I saw the dragon and the mice gnawing at my support. But that was not all. Had I simply understood that life has no meaning, I might have accepted it peacefully, knowing that it was my lot. But I could not be calmed by this. If I had been like a man in the wood from which he knows there is no way out, I might have been able to live. But I was like a man in a wood who is lost, and terrified by this, rushes around, hoping to find his way out, knowing that with each step he is getting more lost, and yet unable to stop rushing about. It was all quite dreadful. And so, in order to escape from this horror, I wanted to kill myself. I felt a horror of what lay ahead of me, and knew that this horror was worse than my present position. But I could neither drive it away, nor patiently await it the end. However convincing the argument that said a blood vessel of the heart would collapse anyway, or that something would burst and it would all be over, I could not wait for the end with composure. The horror of the darkness was too great, and I wanted to escape from it as quickly as possible, by means of a rope or a bullet. It was this feeling that lured me more strongly than anything else towards suicide. That's the end of chapter four, and we're going to get into some very interesting things in the next few chapters, in which Tolstoy starts to assess world philosophy, world religions. Um, he gets into Buddhism and Christianity and, and atheism, as a worldview and he makes a very sober assessment of each and he makes a very intellectually honest assessment of atheism which you do not find from modern pop atheists and so i hope these things are interesting to you and you enjoyed some reading of tolstoy again this is from his confessions and other religious writings and when i get time i'll read chapter five and, and six and seven and so forth. Uh, I don't know how far I'm going to go in the book. I don't think I'm going to read the whole book, but just these few middle chapters are quite interesting. Uh, again, give this video a like and uh, please subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you. Well, there's a there's a guy who's who's got a little YouTube channel uh, and I'm, I have been sending a lot of people his way, Node in a Network, and he's basically been reading all of the stuff in the footnotes of Maps of Meaning where we're all sort of plugged in as like, like nodes on the network. Node in a network, that's a good username. A node in a network. The wrong model, because you're at the center of a network. You're a node in a network.